All right. Um, well, hello, everyone. While well, everyone joins in on Zoom, um, I'd like to welcome all of you. My name is Sarah, and I am the Technical Services Coordinator at the Bracebridge Library. I am very excited that you can all join um, us today. I would like to point out a couple of features that we have with the Zoom webinar. So the first is that we do have the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question for our wonderful author today, you can just ask that in the Q&A. If you have any comments, if you'd like to say hello, you can do that by using the chat. So if you would like your question answered, please make sure it goes in the Q&A and not in the chat because we'll be checking the Q&A at the end of our talk. Now, while people get settled in, um, I'd like to remind you all that you can um, order a copy of the book from your local library. And what we'll do is we'll count how many people need books, we'll put in the order, they'll arrive from us to us, and then they'll come with a signed book plate. So you can have a copy with a signed book plate. It's perfect. Um, for getting a Christmas gift if you are an early Christmas shopper. Also because you should have enough time to read it before you gift it. So uh, you can get those. Um, and um, I don't know if we can ship it that far, but if you, whatever library you're connected to in Muskoka, send them an email and we will find out. Um, the great thing is that um, because we get them directly from the publisher, it is a slightly better price than you'll get from the bookstore. So um, if you're ordering it, make sure you order it from your library. Get that in soon, though, because I think that they'll be counting and sending all the numbers on Monday. Now, um, I see some questions coming in in the chat already, and that is wonderful. Uh, we have a couple of uh, fun things. So I'm going to launch our first poll question. Um, and because it's 10 o'clock in the morning here, and we want to know, um, are you drinking coffee or are you drinking tea this morning? So uh, you can put your poll questions in there and then we will let you know what everyone is having this morning. So as I said, I am from the Bracebridge Library, uh, which is in Muskoka. And in Muskoka, we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe. Today, Muskoka is home to three sovereign nations, the Wadamohawk First Nations, Moose Deer Point First Nations, and the Moon River Métis. These lands are covered by the Williams Treaty of 1923, the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850, and the Jay Collins Land Purchase of 1785. We must respect these treaties and ensure that our governments do so too. Today's author really doesn't need any introduction, but here's some fun facts, if just in case you don't know them. Um, there has been over 275 million copies of his book sold in 114 countries and more than 47 languages. Um, he is the only author to have been number one bestseller in fiction 19 times, short stories four times, and nonfiction as well. Um, he, he has had such an interesting life and um, we can see a lot of that come up in the book that we're about to talk to today. So I'm very excited to do that. Um, welcome, Jeffrey Archer. Thank you very much indeed. It's lovely to be invited to be addressing you. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your book, um, Next in Line? Uh, well, I've written a series of books. You can read them individually, but a series of books about a detective called William Warwick, who, when he leaves school, joins the Metropolitan Police Force as a constable on the beat, uh, despite his father wanting him to go to Oxford University and read law, and then join him in what we call chambers and become a barrister. He defies his father and becomes a police constable. And in every book, he moves up one rank. And in every book, 
he takes on a different challenge uh, from a policing point of view. In the latest book, the fifth one, Next in Line, he's become a superintendent and he's uh, in charge of royalty protection. And his number two, uh, Ross Hogan, an inspector, is in charge of Princess Diana. He's in charge of Princess Diana's personal protection. And of course, I had the privilege of working for Princess Diana in her charity work as an auctioneer. So got to know her quite well over the years. In fact, we became friends. And now you will see in the book, you will be able to read and see if you think I've caught her. Uh, the says at the beginning of the book that, um, is this a true story? What you have to decide is uh, whether it's true or which parts are true and which parts I made up. I, well, I mean, being a librarian, I love that part. And I would go through and you would say something or mention someone and I would quickly look them up and see, is this, is this really something that happened? And I know with a lot of books that are historical fiction or that bring in real facts, a lot of times the most outrageous sounding things are actually the true bits of the stories. Now, well, I suspect when they're outrageous, those are the real ones. When they look sensible and intelligent, I suspect those are the ones I've made up because true life, as we're finding in Britain this week, is far stranger than fiction. Yes. Was there, what was the most surprising thing that you found out about the Royal Protection Team when you were doing your research for this? Well, I, as I said, each book has its own subject. So I've done, uh, we're on royalty protection. I've done drugs. I've done murder. I've done uh, po um, po the police themselves. Uh, and so royalty protection was a tremendous challenge because I don't think it's a subject any author has tackled before. I think it was a new subject. So I asked to see the head of royalty protection. Uh, and he came to see me and he told me that 30 years ago, which is when the book is said, the head of royalty protection was sacked for theft. And I got to the bottom of the story and uh, a fascinating story it was. And then at the same time, one of his officers, a very fine man, was taking care of Princess Diana. So I mingled the two stories, the, the head of the a role to protection who was a complete crook and had to be dismissed. And uh, Princess Diana, you get the two stories and then they intermingle at the end with the big incident with Princess Diana. Mm -hmm. I found that so interesting. And you, you wrapped it up so nicely. So then we were really guessing whether it was something that happened or could have happened um, because there's so much that we just don't know about the royal family and what goes on behind the scenes. Well, that's bound to be the case. I, I don't know either. Uh, it's like any family. It's very private. I mean, you hear rumors and you read things in the press, but who knows what's true? I know what's true when I dealt with uh, Princess Diana and I had the honor of being in being with her on the day she took a pace back from public life and made a speech about withdrawing from public life. I had the honor of being with her that day. The prime minister uh, called for me and said she'd asked for me to be with her all day. So I know the insight on that story, but how can you possibly know if you're not there every day? Mm -hmm. What was it like writing about these real people that you had friendships with? Well, of course, I've done that in almost every book I've written, having worked 11 years for Margaret Thatcher, having uh, been a member of Parliament and now a member of the House of Lords, having worked with Princess Diana. I mean, that's something I've been doing for many years. Mm -hmm. um, one of the um, interesting things that I read um, in the copy that I have, we have some little author notes, is that um, you had an auction in the a novel and you'd actually been an auctioneer at that 
uh, auction that took place. So you really play with the fact and fiction a lot in the novel. Um, was it auctioneering that got you interested in art or were you interested in art before then? Oh, no, I was interested in art long before I became an auctioneer. I used to go to Southerwitz and Christus and then John Major, when he wasn't prime minister, when he was just a backbencher in the House of Commons, asked me to do an auction, a little baby auction in his constituency, which I enjoyed so much. I've been doing them ever since and have raised that uh, I've now done over a thousand charity auctions and raised over a hundred million uh, a, a dollars over the last 40 years. So it's something I enjoy. And so of course it gets into the book because I always say to authors, young authors in particular, write about what you know about. And then the reader will got, say, wow, yes, I, I believe that. I, yes, I, that feels. Don't write a ghost story because they're popular. Don't do sex, violence and bad language because you think it'll sell books. Tell a story. Mm -hmm. And with, I mean, so many different experiences that you've had, there's so many stories to tell. Um, when you have the story, I mean, there's a couple different storylines and you've mentioned them before. You have the one with um, Diana and you have the one with the Royal Protection Team. And then you also have storylines with Miles Faulkner from the other Warwick books. And you have kind of Christina and Beth. Um, you've been writing for a long time, but are there any challenges to kind of weave in all these different stories lines together and make them work? Well, uh, uh, William and Beth. Uh, uh, Beth is my wife, who you were chatting to a moment ago. She, of course, as you probably know, is chairman of the Science Museum in Great Britain and has been made a dame by the Queen. So it's a very strong and remarkable woman. So she she's in the books because I admire strong and remarkable women. Uh, William is based on a man called Lef uh, a man called uh, Superintendent, Chief Superintendent, uh, Johnny Sutherland, who rather sadly had to leave the police force because he had a mental breakdown, what he described as one murder too many. So, uh, and I again say to young people, if you can base your main characters on real people, you'll write them so much more clearly and they'll come over on the page. Miles Faulkner is a different type of criminal because he's very clever, he's very well educated, he's very sophisticated and cool. And that's what William is up against. William is up against this man who is a master criminal. And uh, he runs through all the books. And in this particular one, ironically, he's in prison. And uh, William needs his help when he discovers what is going on. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of times we expect to dislike the kind of uh, bad guys in the book, but I think it's really hard to dislike Miles because he's so clever and he has um, such a fullness to his character. Do you, are there any um, characters that you feel, other than, um, of course, Beth, that you feel really strongly with or that you identify with in this book? No. Um... Uh, the characters develop themselves, funnily enough, uh, and characters are very important. I was, I was genuinely shocked when they did a cloud on me, if you know what a cloud is. I didn't know what a cloud is, uh, where they, they put a cloud up and the public are allowed to ask what, what they think when they read one of my books. And I thought they would say storytelling. I thought the biggest cloud, the biggest thing in the cloud would be storytelling. And I was shocked to discover that the biggest thing in the cloud was character. They like the characters in the book. They like William and Beth. They like Faulkner. They like these other. They want to know more about them. And storytelling was second. So I think why you're driving is that characters in books are very, very important. In fact, if you think about your favorite books, if you think about the books that have influenced you in your life, you know the characters uh, very well indeed. Mm, that's very true. I think that's, you see that even at the beginning when you're talking about place. So you're um, describing the crime museum at the very beginning. And really you're telling stories about different historical characters and not so much about what it looks like, but it's all about these people's stories. So that was wonderful. Um, 
how if the do you have any advice for writers on how to develop characters? Well, you use the word, Sarah, writers. I'm not a writer. I'm a storyteller. And storytelling is a God-given gift. You cannot go down to the local store and buy a packet of storytelling. It's not possible. You can become a better writer with a good education and being well-read. In fact, anybody who's well-read and had a good education can write. But being able to tell a story is a God-given talent. I always say when young people come to see me and answer your question with young people, I say, go to the ballet. And they say, what do you mean, Jeffrey? And I say, go and watch the prima ballerina and imagine how many hours she has spent working to become the prima ballerina. And then look at the dancers behind her and think how many hours they have spent just to be on the stage. And then think about all the thousands of dancers who would love to be on the stage, but don't make it. Why would it be any different for an author who wants to be number one on the New York Times bestsellers list? If you want to be number one, it takes a lot of talent and a lot of hard work. And so I say to young authors, I mean, go out there and have a go. Of course, go out there and have a go. You never know if you are the one, but don't imagine it's any different from being the prima ballerina. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, that reading is really important. Are you reading anything right now that kind of sticks out that you can recommend to us? I'm sorry, I'm losing you now. Oh, I can't hear sorry. you. Sorry, are you, are you reading anything right now? You mentioned that reading- I is never important. stopped reading. Um, I, I, the only time I stop reading is when I'm writing. When I go away to actually write, and I go away for long periods of time, because uh, I write 14 drafts of every book, um, and they take about, a book will take me about a thousand hours. So uh, the writing schedule is very tough indeed. And as I say, I, I go away to do it. But I'm reading, when I'm not, and I'm at home as I am now, I will be, I'll read a book a week. Yes, I read a book a week. This week I'm reading about Kolditz, the German was prisoner of war camp, where so many uh, people, so many brave soldiers escaped between 1940 and 1945. Uh, and so it's not, for me, reading is nonstop, but not when I'm writing. That's very interesting. Are, do you find you choose books just based off of your interest, or are you thinking about the next book and what you're writing next? Well, that's called research. When you're mm -hmm. looking at books simply because the next book is about royalty protection, you read a lot about for the research. But no, I'm a great one for listening to advice. So if someone rings me up and says, Jeffrey, you ought to read this, it's brilliant. I do, uh, and, uh, because it's pretty darn hard to, to find a really good book. Colditz was outstanding, but it's pretty darn hard. I, I, I would confess that I put most books down after 30 pages, and then you get a piece of magic and you love it from beginning to end. Wonderful. I think that's one thing that people uh, need to be able to do is put a book down if they don't like it. I think it takes a, some time for people, then they'll just stick with a horrible book but there's so many books out there that um, they can choose anything. And it takes six hours to, to read a book, Sarah. Well, I mean, most people can do a film for a couple of hours or a half an hour on, on television or a bit on, on the phone. Every author is asking you to spend six or seven hours reading their book. So it's a considerable privilege and honor for an author that they do. Mm -hmm. And you have so many books to choose from. Um, they're short stories and plays and standalone novels and these epic uh, family sagas. If someone was picking you up for the first time, um, where would you recommend they start? Well, the public have decided that because 100 million people have read Cain and Abel. Uh, 
and it's it's I think it's in 101 countries at the moment, and it sells still sells 40 years later a quarter of a million copies a year. So the the public have decided that Cain and Abel is is the but uh, there's I I have a sentimental fan club for not a penny more, not a penny less, and uh, the Clifton Chronicles. But I I see today's book, the one you have in front of you, is uh, number two on Kindle, and it's number two on the Sunday Times. And it's 4.6 out of 5. So I can't grumble. Life goes on. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. I know I started reading um, some of the Clifton Chronicles, and that was really interesting. And then I read a collection of your short stories, and they were absolutely delightful. So I don't think people can go wrong when they're reading one of your books. Well, short stories are a different challenge, of course. When you've got to get a, sometimes a story isn't worth 300 pages, but it is worth 30. It's a vignette, it's a tiny incident. That, and, and, and I don't believe there is a book in everyone. I think that's drivel. But I think there is a short story in everyone. And sometimes a truly remarkable short story, an incident that has happened in their life that has probably only ever happened to them. And I've in my lifetime written 92 short stories. 64 of them were given to me by people telling me real incidents, some of them truly amazing. I mean, I'll give you an example. I, I met a girl in, uh, I met a young lady in California who was, a, and, and, and well, actually, she's now an old lady, but she was a young lady when I met her. And she was traveling to university and she was thumbing lifts. And of course, in the 1950s, 1960s, it was still safe to thumb lifts. And she thumb lifts and this old man picked her up and drove her to Stanford, drove her to the front door where she was studying English at university. And she didn't realize until the car drove away, she'd been sitting with Steinbeck for three hours. Now, she, that's the way she told it. Of course, you turn that into 30 pages because it's a piece of magic. But she had sat with Steinbeck for three hours without realizing who he was. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, I loved about the short stories, especially, is that they're just little tiny snippets of magic and yeah. a lot of cheek. There was a lot of cheekiness in some of those. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a lot. I found that in the in the book that uh, we're talking about today, there is um, a lot of cheek with Princess Diana. And I was a little bit. Um, surprised at how um, lovely she was, because I'm a little less familiar with her than I'm sure a lot of our um, attendees are today. Um, what was um, what was your uh, favorite thing about revisiting um, William Warwick's character and some of these other things, because you have Miles Faulkner and you have um, these characters that go on and on and on for large spans of time, and you can develop them over a huge series of books um, compared to some of the one offs and the short stories where you just get to see someone for a minute. Um, what is it about making these big, long characters that you love? Well, that was an early decision that I would start him off as a constable, he would become a sergeant an inspector, a chief inspector, a superintendent, chief superintendent. And I take him right through so that the end of the, the series will be when he's commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. And I would, during, and that's eight ranks all the way through, and there would be eight different crimes all the way through, eight different subjects all the way through. So each book is an individual book, doesn't matter which one you pick up. And yes, you're quite right. The fun was returning to William, watching him develop, watching his wife develop, watching his children develop, watching the criminals still up against him, determined to bring him down at each stage, uh, watching the wicked, uh, watching the wicked Christina trying to steal money from uh, her ex-husband, Miles Faulkner, while at the same time trying to help Beth uh, bring him down. Yeah. They, uh, I, I, I'm very much looking forward to going away in January and starting the next book when he'll be a chief superintendent. Uh, and I've already got the ideas in my mind, but I'm looking forward to going away in January and being reintroduced to the family 
and taking it on to the next stage. I think they must seem almost like friends at this point because, I mean, and uh, William Warwick didn't start in this book, but he's from a previous series. And that's one thing that I, I always appreciate when authors do is they, they pick up someone that you've loved from a previous series and then you get to see them again. Maybe you get to see them again in a next one. Um, but what's next for William Warwick? What can we, what kind of crime will he be dealing with? If you can tell us. No, I can't. <laughs> no spoilers. No, he's, uh, the next book is top secret because I, I told one person and got told off because it's such top secret that uh, it's going to cause a lot of trouble and interest. So no, I can tell you, I can't wait to write it. I'm so excited about it. Uh, but it won't be out until next September. Uh, so you'll, for, for now, you'll have to satisfy yourself with Princess Diana and the problems she faces uh, when, she, uh, when she falls in love with the wrong man. Uh, but no, I'm going, not going to tell you anything about the new book. Oh, well, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, when you go away in January, because this is book five, are you writing book seven then? Is book six no, done? I've, I've pretty well finished book six, which is the one which is going to cause uh, some considerable trouble and my brain is now thinking about book seven because he will be a commander by then he'll only be three steps away from uh becoming commissioner of the metropolitan police my problem is i'm 82 and i will have to live to the age of 86 in order to get him to commissioner i've no doubt he is capable of being commissioner uh but i'm Got to get to 86 to make sure he does. Well, we all hope that that is true as well, um, because that wouldn't be any good. <laughs> like Sue Grafton, who left before Zed. So we hope that he gets all the way to commissioner. Um, now we are um, getting close to the time when we're going to open up for questions and answers from all of the audience. So I am going to ask that everyone uh, please put your questions into the Q&A and not in the chats. If you put your question in the chat, pop it over the Q&A. Um, we've had one person ask um, what everyone's favorite book is um, of Jeffrey Archer. So if you want to just add that in the chat, uh, we tried to do it as a poll earlier, but because there are so many books, um, I mean, the poll list would be giant and we yeah, can sure, fit everything right. in. Right. So if you, if you have a favorite book, just put it in the chat and let us know um, what was your favorite. Well, so I, I think you're. I think you're quite right. I mean, it's impossible to have a favorite. Well, I suppose it's not for me. It's impossible to have a favorite book. I have a favorite author, and he's called mm -hmm. Stefan Zweig, and I think Beware of Pity uh, is unquestionably a masterpiece. And uh, uh, when I grow up, I want to be Stefan Zweig. I think he's uh, the greatest writer I've ever read. But there are an awful lot of good writers out there, and there are an awful lot of good books. Choosing just one is not easy. I think I'm probably touched by how many people think Cain and Abel is special. I'm very touched by how many people stop me in the street, write to me, let me know that Cain and Abel is very special. And uh, uh, of course, that inspires one to go on. It inspires one to try even harder, but I have to be reminded that Cain and Abel was 40 years ago and is now on its 132nd reprint. So, uh, and it changed my whole life. No doubt about that. Changed my whole life. It must be wonderful to be able to see that your work endures over so long because a lot of books that were published before, yes. um, they get dated very yes, quickly. Right, quite right. Not only dated, I, I've got a friend... Uh, who his first book was a success and the second book did all right and the third book hasn't done well. And I'd say she's broken. I mean, she's absolutely cannot know. She doesn't know what to do with her fourth book. And I've never had that problem. So I'm bound to say that's a bit of luck too, because I'm on the 26th book now and I'm still going flat out and loving it. Uh, I'll stop when I don't. <laughs> 
but I'm, I'm still flat out and loving it. So yes, you're quite right. The uh, longevity is, uh, is the rare thing. People do jump up and jump down or, uh, and, and I've been very privileged and very lucky. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's see. Oh, um, we are getting lots of chats about uh, books that are people's favorite. Um, Cain and Abel is showing up here. Uh, not a penny more, not a penny less. Um, Prisoner of Birth. So there's lots and lots of the uh, titles that you mentioned. So it seems like our readers are just the same as everybody else. Um, all right, so we have some questions and answers coming in. Um, oh, this one is great. This one comes from Cindy. Um, and she asked for um, if you can share any insight into your writing process, how it's progressed. So from Cain and Abel down to um, next in line, what has changed for you as a writer, whether it's your method or how it goes? I think I'm a better craftsman. I think the storytelling was always there from the beginning. The physical process, I rise at 5.30 in the morning and I begin work at six. I write for two hours from six to eight. I take a two hour break and write from 10 until 12. I take a two hour break, write from two until four. I take a two hour break and write from six until eight. I go to bed around 9.30, uh, sleep about 10, up again at 5.30, start the process again. The first draft is about 45 days, 300 hours. And the book you have in front of you, Sarah, is the 14th draft. So it takes a long time. Someone asked me yesterday in an Irish interview, uh, can't you speed it up now? And the answer is I'd love to, but I never get, I just have to go on and on and on until I, I'm satisfied so that if you say I don't like the book, that's fine because I know I can't do any more. But if I handed in the first draft and you said, I don't like it, Jeffrey, I'd say, yeah, I, I should have worked harder. So I work almost until I fall before I hand it in. So uh, that's my process. But everybody else must have their own process. My wife likes work working in the evening. She'll work happily from 10 o'clock till one in the morning. Uh, she is um, an owl. I am a lark. Uh, you've got to do what suits you and what falls in with your lifestyle. Some people are trying to write a book while they're doing another job. So they either have to do it first thing in the morning or last thing uh, at night. And uh, it's very hard work. It could take a long time uh, doing doing it that way i'm lucky i'm a professional writer that is what i do mm -hmm. um now claudette um has a question here um i have read that you do your writing longhand have you ever been tempted to use a computer and i know the certainly, fun not. Thing <laughs> certainly not i'm an old-fashioned thing I handwrite everything with a felt tip pen. Every word is handwritten. It's then typed by my secretary, triple spaced, and I go to a pencil and I work with a pencil and it goes on and on. No, I, my wife has got all the latest machinery on this desk where I'm sitting and she can press buttons and make the most amazing things happen, but I can't. I can switch on the light in the morning at six o'clock pick up my pen and begin once upon a time and pray. Wonderful. <laughs> um, and I know one fun thing on your website is that um, people can see um, one of the drafts that you have written out um, longhand. So if you're interested to see what that looks like, you can check it out on uh, Jeffrey Archer's website. Um, now, uh, Barbara asks, where do you go away when you write your books? Is it the same location or for each one or do you find a different place? No, I have a lovely home in Mallorca overlooking the sea. And from my, my front, it's just one window and all I can see is the sea. So I see the sun coming up behind me for the sixth to eighth session in the morning and at night going down into the sea for the sixth to eighth session at night. Uh, if I look right to my right, I can see uh, the city of Parma and the hills in the background. 
But if I'm only looking to the front, I can only see the sea, which is very soothing uh, and very calming. And I like it very much indeed. Uh, it, it, if I fail, it's my fault because I've got everything to make it easy. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and then, yeah, so this actually answers two questions because Carolyn wanted to know where you do your writing. So that just answered that. So that was wonderful. Um, and it was a popular question. Lots of people wanted to know that. Um, oh, this is a good question from Greg. What was the most difficult book that you wrote? Probably Paths of Glory. Uh, I was reading the non-fiction story of Mallory in 1924, wanting to conquer Everest, and his body being found 700 foot from the top. And they don't know if he was on the way up or he was on the way down. So the research for that was very demanding. And I had to write a novel round whether he reached the top or if he didn't. And I discovered in a brilliant nonfiction book by Audrey Selkin, who was is Britain's expert on Everest. Uh, and she pointed out that uh, Mallory's in 1924, if you think of chariots of fire, you get the feel of when this is uh, exactly the same year. If you think about that, and he fell in love with the most remarkably beautiful woman called Ruth, beautiful, intelligent woman called Ruth when he was a schoolmaster. And my story, I decided after that, would be about a man who'd fallen in love with two women, one Ruth and the other, Chalamunga, goddess, mother of the earth. And he had to conquer Chalamunga, goddess, mother of the earth, Everest, before he could go home and marry Ruth. Mm -hmm. I was very, I haven't, yeah, that would be so interesting. Um, it's great because we hear all about the other books, and now I'm sure lots of people, if they haven't read all of your books, they'll go ahead. There are people who haven't read all of my books. I know. I don't know. Obviously, no one here. Um, I do have another poll question, and this will be, I mean, no pressure for everyone, but um, we'll see if people have if there's anyone here who hasn't read one of your books before, or one of your books yet, we'll say. So, because I'm sure after this, everyone will want there's to go. There's millions of them who haven't read, read my books. <laughs> it's, sometimes it's hard because I know they're so popular. So to find them, um, if people do eBooks, to find them as an eBook or to find them on the shelf, you, um, you can't always just go to the library and pick it up because a lot of times they're at someone's house. Um, Megan asked, do you have a favorite character um, you have written about or a favorite series? So do you have a favorite character from, I don't know, all of your writing? A favorite? Character that you've written. Favorite, favorite person. Character, yeah. Person. Person that you've written. Yes. Um, well, I, it's, it's, it's weak and pathetic to say I loved Cain and I loved Abel and loved the idea of them one coming, one having everything, one having nothing, and they only meet once in their life, but it changes their whole lives. I love that as an idea. In the Clifton Chron Chronicles, Harry Clifton is very much based on me, a writer, and uh, uh, his wife is very much based on Mary. Uh, and in the latest, in the William Warwicks, Yes, I think I like Ross Hogan, who is a rogue policeman who's always stretching the limits of the rules as far as he can get away with. But he's a good man and he does it because he wants he wants to catch the baddies, but he sometimes goes too far. So I like Ross Hogan very much indeed. Wonderful. I'm just looking at the other questions here. Um, and uh, Megan asks, uh, for the prison diaries, um, have you kept in touch with anyone that you've met there? No. Um, and, th and then she says, your books and series are brilliant. So no. thank you, Megan. Um, 
Pam says, um, I embraced your Clifton Chronicles. I love your writing. Each character is individual in its creation and one can enjoy and understand them. I wonder if you pull away from modern day in your writing. Um, she says she sees a trend in what uh, she reads and what authors tend to write about pre-technology era, getting away from the modern day cell phones and computers. Um, mm. Is this something that you do or you tend to do? Um, is it something you do intentionally or would you write something kind of more current with um, laptops and cell phones? And It's a good question, but the, the problem is it's a very modern world that. I mean, if you go back to Dickens, there was no television, no radio, no films, bit of theatre. So when he wrote, they were desperate to have the books because he was the biggest entertainment in Britain at the time, and indeed in the United States as well, and in Canada, uh, very, very big. But nowadays you're up against TikTok, you're up against Facebook, you're up against telephones, you're up against films, you're up against Netflix, you're up against everything. And uh, the book still survives. Uh, millions of books are still purchased every year. And uh, nothing seems to stop them, which is absolutely wonderful. Uh, and I, they keep telling me from when I started 40 years ago, 45 years ago, oh, the book is on the demise. It's not true. Kindle, funnily enough, bought the book back. And uh, I think it's 41% of my sales are on Kindle. So I'm read by millions of people who I wouldn't have got to, but for Kindle. And I met a director of TikTok the other day, at a, and I'd been, gone to see a Cezanne show at the Tate Modern in London. And I bumped into a lady I'd never met her before who was a, a director, an American lady, who was a director of TikTok. And she was saying that TikTok has done wonders because so many young people are reading books because of TikTok. That's wonderful. If they start on TikTok, maybe they'll come to me later. So anything that gets the young to read must be good. Wonderful. Um... All right, Ev Brown has a question here, um, and she asks, what life experience has influenced your writing the most? Human beings. Uh, they, human beings are wonderful because every one of us has problems. Every one of us goes through periods in our life that are not exactly wonderful. And if you can get them to tell you those things, and a lot of people come to me and say, I want to tell you a story, Jeffrey. And they almost want to tell you because they don't know you, but they want to tell someone. And some of them are very mundane and boring, but others can be very, very exciting and very amazing. And I cling on to those. So, uh, because no one does, goes through their whole life in a sort of straight line. I mean, it can be up and down, it can be, it can be all sorts. But uh, so I would say to you, the best thing an author needs, the thing an author most needs is intercourse with human beings so that there is regular going. When I was locked up during lockdown, during COVID lockdown, I truly missed not having people chatter to me uh, and picking up the most amazing individual things. I missed that a lot. Uh, and it's wonderful to be back in the real world now. Uh, and of course, uh, what's happening in England at this very moment with Her Majesty dying, a new prime minister, things not going very well for Britain at the moment, uh, is a story in itself. So I'm alert from six o'clock in the morning until when I go to bed. Wonderful. Um, Joanna, um has a question she says we all feel we know princess diana what would we be surprised to learn about her about princess diana i think that's right i think the statement we all know her has a resonance i agree with that but what you won't have seen unless you've been with her one-on-one -on, -one on your own was the sense of humor mischievous she was a mischievous woman i mean she had all us men absolutely crawling along the ground doing as we were told 
she, we, she, oh yes, oh yes, I always did as I was told. But I loved her company. I loved being with her. Uh, she became a friend of my wife's because she was very keen on how the children were educated. And of course, my wife taught at Oxford and then taught at Cambridge. So she sought advice from her. I think there are little things one spots when you're on your own. A fragility, a sense of what a, what a struggle this all is. And then I mustn't show it when I'm in public. I got a, a bit of a sense of that. And the great privilege of, of being with her on your own and hearing what she, what she wanted to talk about, the problems she had, how she felt about things, and realizing she's just another human being with, wow, who took on a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you. I agree with your question. I, I, it's, a very, it's, a, it's, it's a very perceptive question. I think what you saw was what you got. Mm -hmm. And I think that really, that really comes through in the character of Princess Diana in the book, all yeah. those things. Yeah. Um, I mean, she had, even though Ross had a, a whole lot of cheekiness and a very strong spirit, I mean, she had him doing things. Oh, poor boy. Um, <laughs> poor boy didn't know what to do. He was, well, there's a bit of me in that. I mean, he didn't know what to do. When he's, dry, when he's with her, when she goes to functions, when he sees the people she's mixing with, sees the things she's doing, and he can do nothing about it. But at the same time, he adores her and wants to protect her life. And then the big incident comes when he has to risk his own life. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you spoke about strong women in earlier in our conversation, and there's so many strong women in the book. And we won't do too many spoilers, but it's wonderful how many surprising um, female characters come through as well that you would think like, oh, maybe she's just soft and gentle, but really um, a lot of them have a lot of uh, steel to them. So that was lovely. Well, I had a very, I had a very strong mother. Uh, I was brought up by a mother. My father died when I was 11. I had a very strong mother who became a local councillor, a very keen politician, and had to work very hard to earn enough money to get me to the right, get me the right education. I then had the honor and privilege of uh, working with Margaret Thatcher for 11 years. Uh, and they don't, the women don't come much stronger than that. And then my wife, uh, an Oxford Don, and then a Cambridge Don now, and then chairman of a great hospital, and now chairman of the Science Museum. I've been surrounded by strong women and taken advantage of it. I've learned so much from them. And yes, they get into the books. My women are strong. Uh, and they will go on being strong. I, I like strong women and I like writing about strong women. I've, I've, as I say, you do 11 years with Margaret Thatcher and you, you better be awake in the morning. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, now, there's been a lot of stuff about Princess Diana in popular culture recently. Um, there's been a, different uh, TV shows and miniseries, movies and things like that. Um, did that have any influence on the timing of um, putting out your book or was it always an idea that William Warwick would proceed through the ranks and sometime he would be in the Royal Protection um, Group? Well, I think when I see these miniseries, if you've known a prime minister for 11 years and worked with them, you see obvious mistakes they make, particularly in character. Uh, and, I'm, and the next Crown series appears to be about the breakup of Charles and Diana. Well, I was there. The prime minister asked me to be with her on the day if she came out of public life, I was there. Uh, so they can't know. They weren't there. I was. And so it often annoys me when I see it depicted and think, well, you've just got that wrong. And the other sad thing, of course, is that it's in the interest of any television company 
to uh, stress the problems and exaggerate them uh, so the public cannot be sure. I'm very proud of Next in Line. It's a true depiction of Diana. And I'm proud to tell you that two members of the royal family have written to me and said how much they enjoyed the book. That's wonderful. Um, Lorna has a question. She asks, besides Princess Diana, were you in the company of any other royals on a regular basis? Yes, I've worked. Uh, I don't know them well. I've worked with Princess Anne a lot because she's a big charity lady. I've done 52 functions with Princess Anne. She's a real, she really works that one. She's very special indeed. And I, I have a very pleasant relationship with the Queen Consort when she was uh, when she was uh, Prince Charles, she still is Prince Charles's wife, but when she was not the Queen Consort, because she's a big reader. She's a big reader, is Camilla. And we used to have, we have regular conversations about books, either in writing or oh, she very kindly has invited me to her home on a couple of occasions. And uh, it's all tricky now because she's become the Queen. So I'm not quite sure how to treat her uh, because she's a very, very kind, wise, sensible woman. And uh, King Charles is very, very lucky to have her by his side. He will face some major problems in the next few years. And to have her by his side will be a real adjunct. It will be a real help. Uh, and I know, I feel sure that he is well aware, as I am with my wife, Mary, what a difference it makes to have someone there to discuss problems with and go through them together. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, you mentioned that she's a big reader as well. Um, and we have a, a question from John Knox. Um, and he asks, what is your opinion about Ken Follett's historical novels? <laughs> I don't know if you've read Ken Follett. And if yes, you've enjoyed I them, I I this is a bit of a trap question, isn't it? So we hope that you've enjoyed it. <laughs> he's, he's a fine writer. He's also a very nice man. Excellent. Um, I think that's one fun thing is that because of the career that you've had, there's so many interesting people that you've met that a lot of us will never have had those firsthand encounters or those kind of true stories. Um, I know there is one quote from Margaret Thatcher in the book, and I went to see if I could find out um, if like, is this a real quote from her? And then I was like, you know what? Jeffrey Archer knew her. So even if it wasn't <laughs> recorded somewhere else, this could be something that she said um, on a different occasion. So that it was really nice to see those um, characters come out that um, are real people that we won't ever meet. And the home I'm sitting in, she stayed at many times. And it's gorgeous. I see all those pictures and the stained glass behind. So um, James had a question. Um, are you disappointed that your newer books don't get made into movies? Am I disappointed? Yeah, well, Oh, it drives me mad. I, Cain and Abel was made into a miniseries. Uh, not a penny more, not a penny less was made in. And I thought Cain and Abel was a wonderful miniseries. Uh, they are rethinking. Uh, there are two people at the moment who want to remake Cain and Abel. There's also someone chasing the Clifton Chronicles. And there is also someone interested in uh, William Warwick. But I have to say, my son, my wife's, older son, William, uh, once said, Dad, don't get excited until you're eating the popcorn. And I think that sums it up. I know it's it's difficult, especially with different uh, streaming services and things like that. You hear of shows that get um, taken and then they're not made or they're made later and yeah. seasons yeah. end quick. So it's it's a difficult it's a difficult thing. Millions um, of dollars are involved and vast amounts of human beings are involved. It's not that easy to get a film or television series off the ground. And you, you've just got to be thankful. I mean, I've met a lot of successful authors who tell the same story about, well, we got almost to the cameras moving and it was cancelled. And I had one a couple of years ago where they were going ahead uh, and the, the head of... Uh, 
the head of entertainment at this particular television show was sacked and the five programs he was doing all went out the window. Oh, One of them, mine. Yeah, I think that would be just as disappointing as, as to not getting picked up, but to getting picked up and then canceled or dropped. Um, yeah, yeah. There's just a few minutes left, so I'd like to go back and uh, a first question. We asked people if they're drinking coffee or tea, and 67% of people said coffee and 33% said tea. So we <laughs> seem to be coffee drinkers here. Um, and we asked everyone if they had ever read a book by Jeffrey Archer, and 85% said yes. So there are still um, some people here who are joining in, We've which is lovely. 15%, 15%, I'm still chasing a need. But they're here, but they're <laughs> here. So welcome. <laughs> and that's wonderful. Um, and you've heard lots of different starting points if you are interested in reading. And of course, I will mention again um, that if you do want your very own copy um, of Next in Line, you can talk to your local library. They're going to be making a uh, big purchase order. All the books will be delivered to your local library with book plates. So make sure that you contact your library in Muskoka if you want that um, by phone or email. I'm going to assume Monday afternoon it will be going away. So make sure that you put in your order before then. Uh, Christmas time is coming. Um, and James, oh, here's a good question maybe to end on. James wanted to know if you've ever been to Muskoka. Been to? Muskoka in Ontario. Nope. No, maybe not yet. Um, <laughs> well, it's kind of a, it's a beautiful fall day, but it's a little bit dark and dingy here today. So I hope your weather is prettier there. Um, and it's lovely in Cambridge. Today in Cambridge is, sun is shining. It's a little cold. It's always cold in Cambridge, but uh, it, it's a, it's a privilege to live in, in this beautiful city. Wonderful. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Oh, um, we have had a wonderful time. It's been amazing speaking with you. And I know um, that, um, well, I'm pretty sure we've converted those seven people who hadn't read your book yet. Um, we will be recording this. So if anyone wants to share it uh, with their friends, if you had someone who missed out, you can find it on your library's YouTube channel. You can also find the other author talks that we've done all on your library's YouTube channel. So be sure to check that out. And maybe after you've read the book, you'll want to revisit and see some of the um, things that happened and learn a little bit more. So thank you so much for coming, everyone. Um, thank you, Jeffrey Archer, for um, agreeing to speak with us. It was absolutely a pleasure. Well, thank you, Sarah. Very great privilege to uh, speak to you. As I said halfway through the show, asking someone to spend six hours of their life reading your book is indeed very demanding. And I'm grateful, lucky, fortunate. Thank you. Well, thank you for writing them. And we look forward to books six, seven, and eight of the William Warwick Chronicles. So thank you very much. Bye.